Brussels. I Check the microphone. It's good. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for the 10th annual Norm Brewer First Amendment Lecture. Uh, it is one of the highlights uh, of certainly the Department of Journalism and Strategic Media every year, and I, and I like to think it's the highlight of the university. Uh, I'm Otis Sanford. Uh, I, am the, I hold the Chair of Excellence uh, in Journalism and Strategic Media here on the campus. Uh, and I thank you for coming. Uh, my mass says Tigers together, and it's go Tigers go. We won a big ball game today, and everybody is happy about it. <laughs> go Tigers, go Tigers. 
Well, we will start our program with an official welcome. So please uh, welcome um, the Dean of the College of Communications and Fine Arts, Dr. Ann Hogan, who will welcome us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Otis. And well, good evening. I'm, as Otis mentioned, I'm Ann Hogan. I'm Dean of the College of Communication and Fine Arts, home to our outstanding Department of Journalism and Strategic Media here at the University of Memphis. We are really, really delighted to have students and colleagues joining us here tonight for the annual, and in fact, the 10th, Norm Brewer First Amendment Lecture. This lecture is held in memory of longtime journalist Norm Brewer, and it's sponsored by the Department of Journalism and Strategic Media, the Hardin Chair of Excellence in Journalism, and the student chapters of the Society of Professional Journalists and the National Association of Black Journalists. The lecture series was created to celebrate and to recognize the importance of the First Amendment of the US Constitution. And how important is that at this moment right now? And you know, keeping in the spirit, I guess, of St. Patrick's Day, we are doubly lucky and honored tonight to welcome out-of-town scholars, both professional and students, who will be presenting their research at the Southeast Colloquium of the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Media here tomorrow. So glad to have a wonderful crowd of scholars and students. I welcome you on behalf of the University of Memphis, a comprehensive research intensive university. We have an exceptional keynote speaker here tonight and I am very, very sure that all of us are going to leave this event inspired. Thank you for being here and thank you to all of you who have worked so diligently to make this lecture happen. And it is my great pleasure now to hand it over to my wonderful colleague, Chair of the Department of Journalism and Strategic Media, Professor David Arant. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anne. You see why I invite her uh, to give the welcome, so I get a little love from her. She doesn't always say this when we have our one-on-one -on -one meetings about what's going on in journalism, but we are delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. We're back in person. Oh my gosh. It was uh, three years ago we tried to do this. So two years ago we tried to do this here and this very conference and a week, it was March 2020 and about a week before we were supposed to launch this conference, we had to pull the plug. We made all these elaborate plans. We had things Matt was working his little, you know, off to get everything just right. Suddenly, we had to about face and, and, and within a few days figure out how to do it online in Zoom. And we managed to, and we've done Zoom, Zoom, Zoom for the last, well, two years and have missed meeting and seeing people except the front of their face. And um, even when we tried to do these Zoom social hour, or it, it just wasn't the same. So I've, I've already had a chance to, to reconnect with a lot of good friends who've come from around the country, not only uh, Memphis students and faculty and colleagues and friends from Memphis are here tonight, but we have uh, scholars and students and faculty from all over the country, mostly from the Southeast who've joined, joined us for the 20 five research panels we're doing tomorrow and Saturday morning. So uh, they, they're all uh, uh, bringing uh, their insights from all over the country about media and, and uh, journalism and public relations, advertising, entertainment, whatever. And we're gonna hear about that. So it's just a real delight to welcome all of our guests from the Southeast Colloquium of AJMC. Um, I want to say, especially to our out-of-towners, you've come to a great city on, on a great weekend. The weather is going to be perfect on Saturday. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not a native, uh, so I'm outsider talking about Memphis, but 
I've been here for a while now. This is a great city. It's just there's so many interesting things to see and do. And the food is just phenomenal. It's just great, inexpensive food, barbecue kind of level food. Gus's fried chicken. Or you can step it up to the highest level of food, and it's all good. But if you haven't been, you know, had a chance to visit the Civil Rights Museum, you need to go there. If you haven't had a chance to listen to uh, 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 the uh, the sounds of my youth, which was the soul music that I heard on the on the elevators, it turns out most of it was uh, written and produced at the Stax uh, Music, and uh, and it's always if you have a lot of money, you can go see Elvis. Uh, it's, 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 a great, it's a great tour, by the way, and I'm not trying to downplay it, but they want, what, about $75 to visit now? I think it is. Oh, my gosh. But anyway, Stax is the bargain and the best music museum in town. But you can also just go down the street here to uh, to uh, uh, and, and see where Elvis Presley got his start at Sun Studio. And that's a quick one-hour, um, fairly inexpensive tour there, too. But and then you've got a river. If you really, or if you really want to, you can walk to Arkansas and back. <laughs> and and it's about one mile back over there and one mile back and uh, across the river. And that's pretty compelling too and healthy too. After you get to eating Gus's fried chicken, I guess. <laughs> well, I do want to say a few thank yous before I I, 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 let, I, I let the podium go. Uh, in particular, I want to uh, thank my colleague Otis Sanford for putting this lecture together and funding our, our program and our, our nice reception tonight. Thank you. And uh, we, we also give a shout out to Matt Hot, who's done all the heavy lifting plan and, and, and make this colloquium uh, possible. And we also appreciate uh, the, uh, the folks at the FedEx Institute of Technology, in particular Jasper Delawal, who is the vice president for research for basically sponsoring this the conference by providing the space without charging us yay and um, so uh, and I can't can't not, can't get away from the podium without saying thank you to all of our graduate assistants in our journalism and strategic media department who have been the workforce that have done all the 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 the, the grunt work and we're actually registering you earlier uh, to make this conference possible you'll see many of them uh, in the panels moderating the panels tomorrow too so. Uh, Say hello and introduce yourself, and you, you Memphis people do the same to our our friends who have come from all over the all over the country. Without any further ado, let me say, have a wonderful evening, have a wonderful. We got a great speaker, and have a wonderful conference. And if you can stay around a little longer in Memphis than tomorrow, enjoy the city. Thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Um, let me also give a, a special recognition um, to uh, our hardworking faculty uh, within the Department of Journalism and Strategic Media. With all of the faculty members who are here, would you either stand or just raise your hand? All of our faculty members. And that includes adjuncts as well. I also want to recognize uh, uh, a recently retired faculty member who is with us tonight, Dr. Sandy Utt. Sandy, so good to see you. Thank you for being here. And I wanted to recognize a special guest, a special guest of mine uh, who left his newsroom uh, to come here this evening, the executive editor of the Commercial Appeal. Uh, Mark Russell is here. Mark. Thank you. And as Ann has already uh, made mention, uh, this event is also co-sponsored uh, by uh, the student chapters of the Society of Professional Journalists uh, and the National Association of Black Journalists. And uh, I thank them for their participation uh, as well. Um, Norm Brewer is a guy that I was pleased to know for many, many, many years. I first saw him on television as a little boy because he was a, an anchor, um, weekday anchor for the NBC affiliate here in Memphis, uh, Channel 5. Uh, and when I was a senior in high school, we did a field trip to Channel 5 and I got to see Norm Brewer in person 
And it was the biggest thrill of my life to actually see this guy who was on television in my house every day, and I saw him live. I was just so thrilled. I went back and told my mother and father about it. Um, and I never realized then that years later I would be working with Norm because he went on to be an editorial writer at the Commercial Appeal. Uh, and then after that, he um, was a political commentator for uh, Channel 3, the CBS affiliate in town. Uh, and I got to work with him there uh, and was honored to succeed him in that role uh, after his uh, death in 2010. Uh, but there's a video that can tell a lot more about Norm than I possibly can. And so I want you to listen to this and watch this video that is a tribute to the person that we named this First Amendment lecture for, and that's Norm Brewer. Let us hope that a deal is a deal between the city of Memphis and Bass Pro Shops. Decades before weighing in on issues such as the building of FedEx Forum, Bass Pro Shops at the Pyramid, or Memphis's colorful cast of 21st century politicians, Norm Brewer told a television audience back in 1968 that he supported the sanitation workers' efforts in getting a union. Norm also warned city leaders that if they didn't agree with the sanitation workers, they would be leading the city down the wrong path. That was a great big step. Maxine Smith was the head of the Memphis chapter of the NAACP at the time. It brings back a lot of history. After Norm's commentary, someone even burned a cross in his yard. I never had a cross burned in my yard. <laughs> and I was raising all kinds of hell. <laughs> but uh, he didn't mind taking risks. And that's another virtue of being not only a good news person, but a good person. She later named Norm an honorary member of the NAACP. There are not many like him left. Over the years, Norm continued to tackle the controversial issues of the day, and he was never afraid to tell our leaders if their decisions were not the right ones for Memphis. In 1995, Norm Brewer started doing commentaries for WREG. The man who brought him on board was former WREG general manager Bob Oaf. He was so respected in that newsroom. He was somewhat intimidating because he had that quiet demeanor and all, but there was so much that he had to give, and he gave generously to other young journalists to bring them on. In our newsroom, when Norm complimented fellow reporters, you felt you had arrived as a journalist. He was a consummate journalist. Uh, he did his homework. Um, he provided, in later years for Channel 3, some of the best commentary that you will ever see on local television. Years later, Norm, known for being a fighter, was dealing with a personal fight against cancer. Former Memphis Mayor A.C. Wharton remembered his many conversations with Norm and his impact on Memphis. But I think all of us in government and civic affairs and the citizens of Memphis have lost a friend. Norm's death was a surprise to many, and it affected fellow journalists and politicians who saw Norm not just as a professional, but a friend. Norm's an institution. Uh, it's, um, it's almost as if I look out that window and all of a sudden... Uh, the Mississippi River is not there. Norm was a voice that resonated throughout the community. It was a voice everyone paid attention to when he spoke. He was our uh, Walter Cronkite. His biggest hero was Edward R. Murrow. Uh, he read his books. He went to places where he spoke. He even has a copy, an original copy of Edward R. Murrow's speech that Murrow sent to Norm after he heard him somewhere. So, I mean, he was... He was from that old school journalism. Each day, Norm Brewer worked to live up to Ed Murrell's challenge to journalists of more than 50 years ago. He was fearless in his pursuit of journalism, and I think that's what brought young people closer to it. We are exactly one month from a local election that poses a profound question about where Memphis politics might be headed, to wit, whether the city is still mired in its old notion that all things, all issues begin with color. And he was tough. Former Mayor Willie Harrington says Norm was tenacious. I had great admiration for his abilities. Uh, did we always agree? Uh, uh, <laughs> and quite frankly, on many of his commentaries, he was right on the mark. Friends say Norm was a generous man with an unmatched ability to articulate what he thought was the best for the city. 
a city he covered for decades. And that's a testament to his many years of knowing the community. It's a tremendous loss for our viewers in this community. That's Norm Brewer, and posthumously, let's give him a round of applause. And now it's my uh, great pleasure, or before I do that, let me also mention that um, um, the Norm Brewer Lecture has brought in some outstanding uh, speakers over the years. Um, they have included other Pulitzer Prize winners, Margie, including Hank Klibanoff and Leonard Pitts and Frank Bruni. We've also had uh, print and broadcast journalist Jamel Hill, uh, trailblazing Washington Post reporter and columnist Dorothy Gilliam, uh, and presidential historian Douglas Brinkley has been here for this event. Um, and so we are pleased to have someone of those ilks here tonight. Uh, and here to introduce our speaker, uh, is my colleague, um, you know, they, they call James Brown the hardest working man in show business. I call Matt Hout the hardest working professor in the journalism department. So please welcome Ma Dr. Matt Hout. Thank you, Otis. Uh, professor Sanford, <laughs> to the students in the audience. I have known who Margie Mason was since I was 16 years old. I told my dad that I was going to major in journalism in college, and he replied, well, you know Fred Mason's daughter is a reporter for the AP. That was it. That was the conversation. You see, Margie grew up about four houses down the road from my grandparents in a place called Daybrook, West Virginia. And I say a place and not a town, because a town would be a pretty generous upgrade. <laughs> it's a place that's near and dear to my heart where three generations of my family is called home. It's the kind of place where out-of-town journalists, maybe from the New York Times or CNN, might drop in during a mine disaster, a coal mine disaster, as a parachute journalist and report something using the words hard scrabble people with coal dust stained houses and express utter fascination with mountains so high and valleys so narrow that no sunlight could possibly shine down. But as President John F. Kennedy once said, the sun doesn't always shine in West Virginia, but its people do. Margie Mason is one of those shining lights and certainly not one of those parachute journalists. She's made her career investigating abuses and injustices, hearing from those voices who aren't always heard. Her writing is clear and compelling, her reporting thorough and thoughtful. In the words of another famous West Virginia journalist, Ned Shilton, she's made it her mission to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. She's a graduate of P.I. Reed School of Journalism at West Virginia University and has made her career with the Associated Press, primarily reporting throughout Asia. She was part of a team that in 2016 won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, uncovering abuses and slavery in the seafood industry in Southeast Asia. I'm honored to welcome our 10th annual Norm Brewer First Amendment lecturer and my friend, Margie Mason. Good evening, and, and thank you so much for that um, really lovely introduction that only a true West Virginian would know how to actually deliver. Um, first, I, I just want to say how pleased I am to be here tonight, and I want to thank um, Professor Otis Sanford um, and the university for uh, inviting me here and showing me such Southern hospitality. Um, I'm honored to have been invited to speak at this event in its 10th year. Um, as a longtime foreign correspondent, I often joke that I have been to way more countries 
than cities in the US. So this is my very first time to Memphis, and I'm excited to be here, to have this opportunity to meet so many professors, scholars, and of course, young journalists. And my hope today is that I will encourage some of you to do investigative reporting or social justice reporting, or maybe even foreign reporting. I keep hoping that if I repeat my story enough times to enough people, maybe I can find someone like me who is crazy enough to do all three. Thinking about what I wanted to say to you today really forced me to reflect on my own career and the core idealistic beliefs that I've held on to since high school, which is when I first realized that I wanted to do this work. That belief is that reporters, no matter who they are or where they come from, have the ability to expose horrific wrongs, wrongs that are often committed by the powerful against the weak. I've always been drawn to the way that journalists, armed with a mere pen and paper, can be a brute force that balances out this uneven scale, and in the best case, a catalyst for some form of justice or meaningful reform. This calling has taken me across the globe to some of the most remote corners of Southeast Asia, where I spent nearly two decades learning about and reporting on marginalized and vulnerable populations. I watched way too many children die of diseases that children are not supposed to die from anymore. And I routinely saw families living in absolute squalor with a lack of clean water and limited access to food. What's worse is that no matter how hard these men, women, and even children worked, there was never enough. Not enough to satisfy that very moment, let alone anything left to pull themselves higher. The simple fact of school which most Americans take for granted, is such an impossible idea for many of the world's children that I've had kids tell me that they don't dare to even dream about it. It's easy to wrap a compelling narrative around these types of scenes, but quality, meaningful reporting goes beyond sim simply telling stories of desperation and despair. The best journalism is fueled by outrage, tenacity, and lots of patience, questioning everyone about everything to find out what happened to lead to these circumstances and who might be responsible. Responsible not just for the issues, but how to fix them. It's like peeling back layer after thin layer of an onion, sometimes going back generations to find where things went off course and how exploitative practices have been allowed to continue on for so long. High quality and impact driven journalism is time consuming and sometimes dangerous for both the sources and the journalists writing about them. There's no guarantee every lead or contact will pay off or that the story will even work out. But despite the risks of this work, I believe there's nothing more important. I've always been drawn to stories about people who have been affected by the abuse of power, because no matter what country I'm reporting in, underserved and impoverished people aren't foreign to me. Born and raised in a holler in the mountains of West Virginia, wherever I go in the world, no matter what language is spoken, I hear them. I have heard and seen them my whole life, people who live in some of the most resource-rich places on Earth, where minerals, whether it be coal, jade, or oil, have been extracted. Rivers have been dammed, virgin forests clear-cut, land stolen, and air and water polluted, sometimes for decades or even centuries. Or maybe pharmaceutical companies rolled in and flooded tiny towns with prescription opioid pills. From my childhood, in my home state, I saw how fortunes were made by a few and simply carted off with the government's blessing. That sanctioned inequity damages and sometimes destroys the quality of the education, healthcare, and even infrastructure for the people who were there before the boom and who remain long after the resources are gone. In fact, the local people's poverty typically only deepens. 
I know your professors here, your professor here, Matt Hott, a fellow West Virginian who grew up just a few hills over from me, understands this all too well himself. A lot of people think they can't do investigative journalism, or it is a part of our profession reserved only for special teams, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Beat reporters are perhaps in the best position to see these types of stories and go after them. Whether they're covering climate change, business and finance, or politics, religion, race, ethnicity, or gender, the key is really listening to the communities and the populations you're covering. People are there. They are talking. There are whistleblowers just looking for someone to trust with their information. For instance, if you're covering cops or courts, it makes sense to be in regular contact with men, women, and teens who have journeyed through the system and are now behind bars. Even if you're not writing stories about them as part of your daily work, it's important to have well-placed sources inside a part of a system that is by definition hard to access. When you're listening to all of the voices and contacts on your beat, there's no telling where a small piece of information might lead. For example, a couple of years ago, my colleague and longtime collaborator, Robin McDowell, started volunteering with a prison newspaper in Minnesota. She wasn't there looking for a story, but eventually some of the incarcerated reporters she was mentoring confided in her. Many inmates, they said, believed Mayan Burrell, who was sentenced to life as a teenager, was innocent. The young black man was convicted in a highly politicized case of killing an 11-year-old girl and had already served nearly two decades in prison. From those tips, Robin and I started looking at the case, and we soon found major flaws with Mayan's investigation. Over the next year and a half, we dug deeper and deeper, discovering that the case was handled and mishandled by none other than Senator, Senator Amy Klobuchar who at the time of Mayan's arrest was Minnesota's top prosecutor. After the story was published in early 20, 2020, Klobuchar, who was then a candidate for the presidential Democratic nomination, faced immense public pressure. Although she called for an independent legal investigation into Mayan's case, she was shouted down by protesters and blocked from speaking in her home state just before she dropped out of the race. And just 11 months after our first story came out, something amazing happened. Mayan walked out of prison a free man. It was the first time in nearly 30 years that someone convicted of a violent crime in Minnesota had their sentence commuted. That is the true impact of journalism. One of the pillars of our democracy is the First Amendment. The First Amendment is the power of the free press. It gives us the right to be present and examine any injustice. For many of us, just like education, it's something we take for granted. But once you've lived or worked in a country where there's no such thing as a free press, as I did residing in a communist country for nearly a decade, you see every day what a foundational freedom it truly is. In many places, the state controls every aspect of the media, using it as a powerful propaganda tool and sometimes as a weapon. In the US, that tool, that power, it belongs to us. We have actually been given a license to serve as watchdogs, to call out greed and corruption and discrimination that otherwise would know no bounds. But coming back to the US after nearly 20 years abroad, I've learned that the traditional news industry I grew up in has taken a beating due to a large decline in advertising. Smaller newspapers that were once investigative bulldogs have been hit by cost-cutting layoffs and shrinking page, page counts. Many of them have completely folded. There are less and less resources for the types of stories, especially in smaller markets, that expose secrets and hold people to account. Digital platforms, philanthropy, and fast-moving technology have created tons of new opportunities for innovative reporting, including in smaller communities. But sophisticated disinformation campaigns, so-called fake news, 
and an absence of ethics and formal training have eroded public confidence in the media at never before seen rates. And it's not just journalism that's under threat. Often the reporters themselves are targeted. Russian President Vladimir Putin just signed a law that could imprison journalists up to 15 years for using words like war and invasion to describe what's now happening in Ukraine. Local journalists and foreign reporters, including two very experienced war correspondents working for American outlets, have already been killed there. Several others have been injured, and I fear we will see more. All told, around the world in 2021, 45 journalists died. Some were hit in combat or killed during dangerous assignments, but according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, nearly half of that total were murdered. One of those journalists was a freelance photographer killed late last year in Myanmar, where I've spent a lot of time reporting. He was covering one of the many protests that had erupted following a bloody military coup there. He was taken into custody and interrogated. He died after allegedly being tortured. His name was Sol Nai. Sol Nai wasn't alone in his arrest. In fact, the number of journalists jailed in 2021 hit an all-time high of 293, Myanmar experienced the biggest surge, trailing only China in total detentions. Imprisonment, torture, and deaths aren't the only attacks. We know the government here has monitored journalist phone calls in the past and that private high-tech surveillance firms have spied on reporters. An investigation last year by a global group of reporters explained how one Israeli company was able to secretly work its way into journalists' smartphones, gaining full access to their files, contacts, even their microphones and video cameras. Attempts to undermine reporting seem to be coming from all directions. After colleagues on my own investigative team published an article highlighting racism in the military, a lawmaker right here in Tennessee, just two months ago, introduced a House resolution to, quote, reprimand the AP for doing yellow journalism. We stood by our reporting. I have faced some pretty incredulous pushback for my own work as well. In 2015, just after my colleagues and I exposed heinous, long-standing abuses in Southeast Asia's fishing industry, Thailand's prime minister remarked that anyone writing about human trafficking in his country's $7 billion seafood business should be executed. His public comments came after we had spent more than a year investigating migrant fishermen, mainly from impoverished Myanmar and Cambodia. These men were tricked or sold onto Thai boats, sometimes with the help of police. Many thought they were getting jobs at factories. Instead, some were drugged and woke up on bo boats bound for waters thousands of miles away. They were forced to work for years around the clock with little food or clean water and almost no medicine. They were whipped with stingray tails. Some were thrown overboard or their bodies were tossed in the freezer while their crew kept on fishing. They were literally trapped aboard floating prisons. Their story wasn't new. In fact, it had been happening for decades and was viewed as an open secret. Other journalists had written about the problem but nothing had resonated largely because previous reporting had consisted only of stories told by former fishermen who had somehow managed to escape, sometimes years earlier, and were no, and were no longer in danger. No one had committed the time or resources, the risk I mentioned earlier, to search for men still held in captivity. And there had been no time or resources invested to follow that cargo from those slave ships to see where their catch ended up. Those two things were exactly what my colleague Robin and I, McDowell and I set out to do. We knew our plan was ambitious. We were told the problems were too complicated, too entrenched, too big to be properly exposed. But Robin and I are a little crazy and not easily deterred. Others' doubts only drove us harder to find the story, the truth about what was happening to these men and the fish they were catching. What we uncovered was incredible. We found a slave island in a remote corner of Indonesia. 
There we saw for ourselves the worst abuse of power. We found men locked in a cage for simply asking to go home. We found men begging us for help from the decks of their ships. We found an overgrown graveyard with dozens of crude wooden markers where fishermen were buried under fake names and nationalities that were given to them to support the lies of their captors. We found the graves of men whose families back home had no idea where they were, let alone that they were dead. Our time and resources had led to the discovery of human rights abuses that others had only heard about. But there was still another piece to the story. We needed to find out who was buying the seafood harvested by these enslaved men. And we did. We used technology to track a ship loaded with their catch, watching on our computers as it traveled in real time to a port in Thailand. From there, we flew in and spent four nights on the ground, painstakingly following truck after truck, delivering the seafood to local distributors. That allowed our team, which by then had grown to include two more reporters, to eventually make connections to the supply chains of some of America's biggest food companies and pet food brands. Household names like Walmart, Cisco, Kroger, Safeway, Fancy Feast, and even Publix and Piggly Wiggly, where I'm sure many of you buy your groceries. The work was hard, long, and risky, but we knew people were depending on us to alert the world to their suffering and to show how families thousands of miles away in America were unknowingly playing a part. Within a week of publishing, the Indonesian government launched a rescue. When word spread on the island that the fishermen were finally going home, the sky opened up and rain began to pour. Men sprinted through the storm toward the rescue site, fearing they would be left behind. They ran from the hills, from the jungle, and from their boats, clutching plastic shopping bags that held everything they owned. They laughed and embraced, soaking wet, drunk with happiness. Their nightmare was finally over. They were free. Over the course of that year, more than 2,000 enslaved fishermen returned home to their families. Because of our work, national and international laws were changed Businesses were closed, ships were seized, lawsuits were filed, and perpetrators were jailed. And system-wide reforms in the fishing industry continue to this day. That is the true impact of journalism. Today, I am a full-time investigative reporter, which feels like a real luxury. But I did not hold that title when we began. When we started our work on that series, I was just a regular daily reporter working on lots of different stories at once. I was covering everything from plane crashes to earthquakes and elections to ethnic cleansing. In the beginning, the fishing stories were literally a side project. Seafood from Slaves turned out to be a classic example of follow the money, a key tenet in investigative journalism. The sad fact is that money and the desire to make it almost, are almost always the root cause of whatever evils you're exploring. In our case, there were questions about who was bankrolling the fishing operation and who was profiting from the slavery at sea, forcing us to look at a complex spider web of supply chains. We wanted to show that we, as consumers, are all complicit by buying the seafood and pet food. The stories I've talked about today are examples from my own reporting simply because I know the ins and outs so well, but they are in no way unique. There are so many other journalists around the world whose amazing projects focus on some of the most oppressed communities and people who are being abused, neglected, and targeted. Even during the past two years of the pandemic, the quality of investigative journalism has not faltered. And much of the best work is being done right here in the South. In fact, a great piece of jur investigative journalism came out of Tennessee last year. Nashville Public Radio and ProPublica looked at the juvenile justice system in Rutherford County, where officials were locking up children, children who were disproportionately black at an unprecedented rate. Part of the story's gripping narrative focused on four elementary school girls 
the youngest just eight years old, who were arrested and handcuffed for a crime that didn't even exist, watching other young kids fighting and not intervening to stop them. Another recent example is at the Tampa Bay Times, where reporters questioned why one Florida county had more cases of adult lead poisoning than any other in the state. They homed in on, lead smel on a lead smelting plant where car batteries are recycled, interviewing more than 100 current and former workers and poring over more than 100,000 pages of documents. The reporting team found all kinds of problems, not just lurking inside the plant, but seeping into the community. Their work prompted action and keeps continuing to have impact. And my own colleagues at the AP dug up secrets within the Louisiana State Police, showing officers effectively hid incidents involving black motorists. Those incidents included the 2019 death of Ronald Green, whose death troopers insisted was the result of a car crash during a chase. But our reporters kept peeling the onion, kept digging, eventually uncovering body cam video that showed white troopers zapping an unarmed man with a stun gun, putting him in a chokehold, punching him in the head, and dragging him by his shackled ankles. The 49-year-old didn't die from injuries sustained in a car crash. He died in police custody, a fact that had been kept secret for two years. And that is the true impact of journalism. Thank you so much. We have just a little time for any questions that anyone has for Margie Mason. If you want to ask, oh my God, that's loud. If you want to ask a question, hit the button on your thing. Yeah, hit the um, button on your mic. If someone else wants to do one, you can see it and your light will light up green. Uh, it's red while you're speaking, green while you're waiting, and green and blinking when you're next. All right. Anyone with a question for Margie Mason? Yes, Brandon. Yes. Is that Brandon up there? It is. It Come is. on, it ask is. Right. Um, So when it comes to investigative reporting, what would you tell, hypothetically, a graduating senior journalist? What would you tell a graduating senior journalist? Um. Interesting. I would tell you that any story can be an investigative story. And I, I think that so often when you're young that people try to put you in a box or maybe they, you, you think that maybe you don't have the skills yet to do this kind of journalism because, as I said, it's, you think it's only reserved for you know, people with a lot of experience on special teams. But any story can be an investigative story. Um, you know, on your beats, if you're a general assignment reporter, um, throughout my career, I've always tried to, whatever story I'm working on, you know, even if it's a breaking story, you can dig a little deeper and file a FOIA, see what comes back. And you can, you can definitely, and, and then if you get something good, um, and this is the other thing I'm going to say, and, you know, the editor in the room is probably not going to like this, but um, I always tell people that I don't tell my editor everything I'm doing all the time. Yeah, you know, like you don't have to tell them everything because they might say, oh, that's going to take too much time or, you know, don't, you know, we, we need you focused here. So you just have your little side project. And then when you get to a point where you get something really juicy, then you take it to the editor and, well, it's really hard for them to say no at that point, right? <laughs> Great answer, Margie. Did I see a question over here? Yes. Yeah. Um, with all the side projects that you do and in your experience, how have you balanced like the work personal life kind of balance there? Um, and any tips for younger journalists who want to like take on those kinds of side projects and investigative work while also not overwhelming or cutting themselves short? I, I, yeah, it's hard to hear with your mask, but you were asking me how I balance my, mm -hmm. my life. Yeah, how you would balance the side projects with being able to also make sure you're doing all the rest of your work well and also not overwhelming yourself. I work a lot. I think <laughs> I work, yeah, I'm a workaholic. I think most um, 
AP uh, reporters are, we are very, very driven. And when you're overseas, as I was, I mean, I was also bureau chief of a country with 240 million people, right? So I was over 18,000 islands. Um, so dealing with that, and I mean, Indonesia is, I think it's safe to say that it's like the disaster capital of the world. So we were constantly having volcanoes, earthquakes, mudslides, tsunamis, you know, plane crashes, and so, and also terrorist attacks, um, it, you know. So you just, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that, that we did with this project, and we often did, is I, you know, I would travel to a lot of different countries, and I would go in to do one story, but then I would always double up. So, you know, I would report and meet with people for other stories that I might be working on. Um, and you might not be jumping around from country to country, but when you go out to do something, you can double up your reporting, and that, that helps. Okay. Thank you. In other words, we're multitaskers, and there is no such thing as nine to five, right? <laughs> no. Okay. Mark Russell. Yeah, I can say, uh, Thank you for your, your comments. I'm, I've been inspired by your comments. <clears throat> I can say with certainty, as one of editors, editors in the room that we know that reporters don't tell us everything they're working on. <laughs> and when I was a reporter, I was the same way. My question is really about your job as a foreign correspondent particularly. What is the biggest challenge you face as a foreign correspondent and how did you overcome it? I think every day was a challenge. Um, I mean, you, you know, you're there and you're living in the country and you are a student the entire time that you're there. You're trying to learn as much as possible. You're soaking in from your colleagues through other local journalists. Um, but you never quite understand everything. I mean, I lived in Jakarta for eight years, and I don't understand the political, the politics there. It's just, it's, it's a, you know, I think that trying to, you know, trying to kind of figure out and navigate everything. I mean, obviously there's language issues too. Um, you know, with our reporting, uh, there's a lot of safety issues. And so one of the biggest challenges I think is, you know, I, I'm a foreigner and I have an embassy there and an American passport. I can just leave if there's a problem or even if I'm, you know, get into trouble, you know, the AP is going to come, the embassy is going to come, but the people that are, you know, helping you, the fixers, even the local reporters, um, and certainly the people that your sources you have the sources. I mean, you have to be so mindful about what you're doing because, you know, like for the fish project, the palm oil project that we did, we didn't use any names except for the people who were home in our palm oil project because we were terrified that, you know, they would face repercussions. So I think that a combination of you know, learning and trying to, that's a challenge the whole time. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Hi. Yes, right here. I'm sorry. Hi. Um, his question was almost verbatim to mine, but <laughs> not really. Um, so what is the hardest story that you've ever done, and how did you overcome it? What was the hardest story? Maybe it was one that you talked about. Right? Yeah, I actually think the hardest story, I mean, the fishing story was very hard, but it was also very um, kind of, once we found the island, things moved pretty quickly. I mean, one of the problems with the fishing story that I'll, I'll add um, was that before we could publish, um, the men who had spoken to us that we were quoting in our story, we were using their pictures, we had video of the, of the man in the cage, all these things were really powerful and we had their names, they wanted us to use their names. But we were really worried that they would be endangered. And so um, I remember we had a call and uh, you know, they asked me, the, the editor said, well, what, you know, we, we were saying, look, we can't, we're going to have to just not use the names, not use the faces, because we can't guarantee their safety, and there were no phone lines to where they were. And so then they said, well, can we come up with an idea? And, and, I, and I, somebody said, well, we could try to rescue them, which 
seems like a crazy idea. And then, of course, you know, the editor said, yeah, why don't you go and do that? <laughs> um, and so I had to, I had to approach um, a really good source of mine at the IOM who had been helping me to ask him if he could help get these guys to safety. And that's a really interesting ethical conversation, right? Because normally we as the reporters, we're taught, do not involve yourselves. But in this particular case, we did so. And we were able to get them off the island and get them to safety. And then we were able to publish and you know, use the, the images and their names and know that they were not in danger. Um, the other one that was really difficult, as I mentioned, was the palm oil project that we published in 2020. And, um, you know, there were women and children and people who were um, extremely vulnerable that were talking to us. And, you know, they didn't really know maybe the, the danger of, you know, using their names or their faces. And I think we were really very careful about it. And what we did was... Um, we ended up talking to, I think it was more than 130 uh, workers. So that helped us to kind of make up for the fact that we weren't able to um, use the names or the faces. You know, you can imagine we had a huge project and there were no faces. Um, but the pictures were still, in some ways, more powerful, I think. And then yes, okay. You made a comment earlier. Oh my God, this is echoing. I'm so sorry. Um, so you made a comment earlier about um, most of your investigating being, or like your source or what you would find was greed and money. Applying that to Memphis, where would you start? And like, where would you start your investigation here? And what would you be looking for? <laughs> What'd she say? Take your pick. If you were starting in Memphis, where would you start with oh. the green and money? Oh my goodness. That well, might be a question for Mark Russell. I think, I think that would be much better because I'm not from here and I've been out of the country for two decades. So I don't know Memphis, but. The, the well, first politician you come in contact with, start them. <laughs> I guess, okay, I can broaden the question to be like any, like where, where do you start? Where do you look for your story? Like how did you, um, you didn't go to Thailand and just be like, oop, I know that those fishermen are slaves. Like, so where would you start in your investigation? Okay, well that's actually a really good question that I can answer. Um, so... I think I told you, well, I can, I, I'll go back in time. In 2007, I was um, a regional medical reporter. So I was covering all of the Asia Pacific medical issues. And I was in Bali in 2007 working on a story about HIV in fishermen. And while I was there, um, you know, I was talking to some researchers and this guy was telling me, you know, some of these guys are out at sea for like years at a time. And, you know, they're like these floating prisons. And so I kind of came back and, you know, that was ding, ding in, the, in my head. And I came back and I told Robin, uh, hey, we should add this to our very long list of story ideas. And I put it on there. And then, of course, we got busy with, you know, so many other things. And then in 2014, we were covering... Um, the uh, Rohingya, which is a uh, Muslim minority group in Burma, and they were being persecuted and they were fleeing by boat in mass. And so we were dealing with the sea and we were dealing with the Rohingya. And then we started finding, you know, in that reporting, these illegal fishermen started popping up. And so then through the course of that reporting, I started, we started pulling at this thread of these fishermen and it, it just started clicking. And at that point I was in Indonesia. So I was in a position to, to really explore this from there. Robin was in Myanmar. So the two of us were in key places and we sat down and, and I said, look, these numbers are going up. And we came up with this plan to find men and to trace their fish. Okay. John, John, you? Yeah, okay. Um, 
How you doing? Uh, I was just wanting to ask, like, as an investigative reporter, what was the greatest moment of your career? Oh, oh, wow. Well, you know, I think probably the greatest moment was there was a man who, who was from Myanmar, and he had been, he was one of the fishermen, and he had been trapped in Indonesia for 22 years. And he had not had any contact with his mother or anyone in his family for 22 years. And so I met him, and his story was just incredible. And so I, I followed him, flew back to Burma when he was going home. And I, I followed him and went with him to his village. And he, you know, everything had changed. And so he, he gets out of the car, and his sister's there, and they, they're just, you know, embracing and falling apart. And then his mother comes. And they're on this, they're in this really poor village in Myanmar that's like a dirt road. And his mother starts coming. And they literally just fall into each other's arms. And it was, it was like a movie, it, you know? And I, I felt so many different emotions at that time. I felt, you know, he had lost all these years but now they were reuniting and I was crying. I mean, everybody was crying. It was just this, this moment. And I kept thinking, journalism did this and it's happening over and over again in villages all over the region. So I think that's probably the greatest moment out of many. Thank you for that Thank question, you. Johnny. Thank you. Turn off the notes. All right, Brandon. One more. Oh, yes. Um, I know recently I read a story about a Ukrainian journalist called Brent Renato, and he recently, you know, got assassinated because of, like, the Russia and Ukraine conflict. And my question is, in situations like those or, like, Indonesia, what motivates you to, like, pursue the story knowing it could be, like, severe, you know, damages or, you know, things happening to you? You know, I think that we have this, you know, belief that what we're doing matters. And I mean, I know I've lost friends and you know, colleagues have been injured. Um, right now, you know, we have, we have a whole team of people working in dangerous places. Um, but I think that, you know, there's just this desire inside to tell the world what's happening. Um, you know, we often say that we write the first draft of history. And if we're not there, then who's going to know what's happening? And so I think that a lot of people who do, especially the really dangerous war reporting, you know, they are uh, very selfless and they, and they really believe in what they're doing. And I think you have to be, you know, committed to do it. Got time for about three more questions right here. Um, uh, when you first, or when you were kind of talking about the fishing story, you mentioned the phrase follow the money. Um, and I feel like lately in uh, American journalism, we are seeing more and more that uh, uh, the journalism, I guess, industry is not immune to that. Uh, and that like greed and the pull of like investors or leaders within different like media companies sometimes determine like the stories that are told and not told. Uh, and so with that in mind, like what gives you hope for the future of the First Amendment in America and journalism in America? You give me hope. All of you give me hope because you're the next generation. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be doing this forever. <laughs> um, I mean, and I also feel like there's so many um, organizations. I mean, I know in West Virginia, uh, there's this amazing, you know, Mountain State Spotlight that has started up. And there's all these small, you know, really strong, um, and, and they have, you know, people who are very experienced kind of leading it. And I think, you know, we're going to see more and more of that. Um, and, I, and I do feel like with investigative reporting, I mean, the, the, the thing about it is that there's all this chaos and we're all kind of overwhelmed with so much every day. There's just so much stuff coming in to our Twitter feeds and everything else. But... I mean, I don't know. I think a lot of people, based on the metrics that we're seeing, when there's a really good investigative story, they not only look at it, but they stop and read it. 
And you know what I'm talking about. When there's something that's really good and it's like, wow, this is something. And people talk about it and it makes a difference. And so I feel like there is a real hope for you know more and more investigative journalism, um, high quality. And I think that you know there's going to be more and more of these nonprofits. And you know, I mean, AP's been around for 175 years, so I don't think we're going anywhere. And I know our team is growing. I mean, there's just a real appetite for it right now. Right here, and then we'll wrap up. Um, hi, thank you for sharing your story. I'm curious um, if, I don't, I'm not sure if this happens or how often it happens, but have you ever been like kind of invested in investigating a story and then find out that somebody else is working on the same or similar story or something like that? <laughs> yes, I have. Um, and that is not a fun thing to find out. Uh, and you have to kind of, you know, manage it, and that is the thing. We are all very competitive. Um, you know, we tend to, when we're working on a project, we tend to keep it pretty close to, we don't, we don't talk about it a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, there have been a lot of times when I'm working on something and then I find out somebody else is working on something similar. What are they doing? What do we know? I mean, there have been times when my sources oftentimes have called and said, hey, such and such from you know, this organization is working on this, you should know that they're looking into this, <laughs> which sends the anxiety through the roof. Um, but, you know, I, I, I guess there's just, there's so many stories, even if somebody's working on something similar to yours, I mean, it's probably not gonna be exactly the same, but I mean, certainly, if you find out, you might have to work a little bit faster and a little bit harder. And last question. Hi, I was wondering how did you go about gaining access to the island that you were talking about um, to get the pictures and all of those things? Um, well, we had heard about this island. We, we had been in touch, you know, we've been networking and sourcing with a lot of people and we'd been in touch with um, a local organization in um, Thailand. And there were, there were Thai fishermen on these boats as well. And so they had made some trips, not to that island, but to the region, um, that island chain. And so they had mentioned to me, well, we've heard about this island called Benjina, and we couldn't find it on the map. We had a big map. We couldn't find it. And they said, well, we're going to go check it out. And I said, well, hey, can we go with you? So then we, we kind of like went with them as they went. And then we took, we had um, a videographer and a photographer who were Indonesian. And Robin went, um, and so the in, two Indonesians kind of went off, and and they kind of served as the the decoy in a way. Like they were like, "Oh, we have a new fishing minister. This is a big, rich fishing grounds. We'll go and um, you know look at what you're doing there with the company." And then Robin was kind of going around, you know, and and doing her thing, and then. Once it became clear that a lot of these fishermen were um, Burmese, Robin doesn't speak Burmese, so she then called in um, Esther Tucson, who was our Burmese reporter that she was working with in Myanmar. So then Esther flew in, and it took like, I think it took like over 24 hours. I mean, there were like multiple planes, multiple boat rides. And then Esther then arrived, and, and then with the language barrier broken down, and of course the men, they hadn't seen a Burmese woman for some of them years. And so she was like a little sister and they all wanted to gather around and, and talk. And they were handing, one man handed a picture of himself to them as they were leaving. And he said, please take this and give it to my mom so she'll know I'm alive. Because, you know, there was no phones there. I mean, it was just it was isolated. It was north of um, Australia and kind of just um, west of Papua New Guinea, and just nothing around it. So it was uh, it was a challenge on a lot of fronts. But that's how we that's how we got there. Ladies and gentlemen, Margie Mason. I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, if there's any student uh, who needed to see me for extra credit, 
please do so before you leave. <laughs> we believe in giving extra credit uh, to come here. I want to thank uh, all of my colleagues in the Department of Journalism and Strategic Media, uh, and all of you, all of our guests who are here for the uh, conference this weekend. Um, as David Arant said, uh, have a good time in Memphis. It's hard not, you have to work at not having a good time in Memphis. Uh, this is the end of our program. Thank you so much for coming.